Welcome to the Dispute Sports Podcast Show. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm your host, Kyle Newman, joined by my good friend and co-host, Rhett Hensley. Today we have a special guest on the show once again, but a new one, my friend and Kentucky Everything sports fan, Shane Krieger. We have an all-March Madness show this week. Again, so let's get into it. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Shane. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. It's uh, uh, really an honor just to be on the seventh, uh, isn't that right? Number seven of Dispute Sports. That's right, Podcast. number seven. So, uh, and, and getting the uh, first time we got to chat with Rhett, so looking forward to it. Good deal. Rhett Hensley, how are you doing this morning, well, I'm buddy? I'm doing great. Ready to talk some sports, and it's great to have you on, Shane. I appreciate that. I'll try not to be too big of a homer. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, I try that every show. And sometimes it's not so easy, and this is going to be another one of those. Well, all right, gentlemen, loaded show today. I want to start it off with just kind of recapping the first and second round games. Just go ahead and, you know, let everyone know what happened with what teams beat who leading to – where we are at now with the Sweet 16 starting tomorrow, and then we'll we'll get each of our takeaways from the first and second round, discuss that, and then we'll kind of preview the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight this weekend. So the first round on March 16th and 17th was a lot of exciting basketball, but there were not – as many upsets as I think a lot of people like you, Rhett, predicted. So let's go down the line here. Villanova beat Mount St. Mary's. Wisconsin beat Virginia Tech. Virginia beat UNC Wilmington. Florida beat East Tennessee State. USC beat SMU. Baylor beat New Mexico State. South Carolina beat Marquette. Duke beat Troy. Gonzaga beat South Dakota State. Van Northwestern beat Vanderbilt, Notre Dame beat Princeton, West Virginia beat Bucknell, Xavier beat Maryland, Florida State beat Florida Gulf Coast, St. Mary's California beat VCU, Arizona beat North Dakota State, Kentucky, your Wildcats <laughs> Shane beat Northern Kentucky, Wichita State beat Dayton. UCLA beat Kent State, Cincinnati beat Kansas State, Butler beat Winthrop, Middle Tennessee beat Minnesota, Arkansas beat Seton Hall, North Carolina beat Texas, Texas Southern, Louisville beat Jacksonville State, Michigan beat Oklahoma State, Oregon beat Iona, Rhode Island beat Creighton, Purdue beat Vermont, Iowa State beat Nevada, Michigan State beat Miami, Florida, and Kansas beat UC Davis. So then on to the second round, March 18th and 19th. Wisconsin upset Villanova 65 to 62. Florida beat Virginia 65 to 39 in a rout. Baylor beat USC 82 to 78. South Carolina beat Duke. 88-81 in a nice upset. Gonzaga beat Northwestern in what turned out to be a good game, 79-73. West Virginia held on to beat Notre Dame, 83-71. to Xavier upset Florida State handily, 91-66. Arizona beat St. Mary's Cal, 69-60. Your Wildcats, Shane. In a close one, beat Wichita State 65-62. UCLA beat Cincinnati 79-67. Butler beat Middle Tennessee State 74-65. And North Carolina beat Arkansas 72-65 to give us our sweet 16. Wisconsin to take on Florida. Baylor to take on South Carolina, Gonzaga to take on West Virginia, Xavier to take on Arizona, Kentucky to take on UCLA, 
North Carolina to take on Butler. Those are our Sweet 16 matchups, gentlemen. So here are my three takeaways to the first and second round, and then I will get your guys's. First of all, for me, the lack of upsets in the first round were made up for with the great upsets in the second round. Second of all, the Big Ten and the SEC had a reputation all season for being the worst Power Five conferences, and now they're looking like they were underrated all year long and are two of the best conferences. Third takeaway, the officiating in this year's NCAA tournament has been the worst it has ever been by a landslide, and it's a darn shame. All right, I will get your take now, Mr. Shane Krieger. What were your takeaways from the first and second round of the tournament? Uh, some of them's going to follow you, but I, going into it, I kind of thought the ACC was overrated as well as the Big 12, so I was happy that uh, uh, the SEC had three. Vanderbilt uh, should have won that first-round game, uh, and we'd have went undefeated. And uh, uh, as many Pac-12, for some reason, this year I've become a Pac-12 guy. Uh, the, I mean, they're, they're as good as anybody from the top top three and up maybe not the whole conference uh, so when USC made a run they had a chance to actually be in the sweet 16 they kind of run out of gas there at the end and uh, I'll agree with you on the officiating as well I mean it that guy for Northwestern uh, I mean you can't blame him for for losing his mind then you had the North Carolina game where Arkansas actually in my opinion had control of the game and then you know you had a walk and then he charged and then he made the basket, you know, no, no calls whatsoever. But, uh, uh, I kind of caught all the late games, both, uh, both rounds. And, uh, there were some dandies that Purdue game, uh, come down to the end. Uh, and then lastly, I, I think the Michigan story's pretty cool. I, I'm a big believer in, in fate and, uh, to seeing that right, you know, after their, their plane run off the runway and, and, uh, they're still rolling, and I think they got a chance. Um, Will they play tomorrow night? Um, yeah, almost, almost like it's their destiny, no, right? To 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 win it all. I do understand what you're saying there, and uh, it should be a very good matchup that they have. Yeah, they're actually favored by one against Oregon, and Oregon lost their big man. So I mean, I think yeah. they got a chance to tell you what. Actually, we'll uh, they're not looking Yeah, for, Rhett, go, Rhett, go ahead. Michigan. What were your takeaways from the first and second round? You know, I think the one thing we need to be watching is the Big Tens, you know. Um, you got some players in there that, that like to get down and dirty. And I think that the teams aren't, you know, getting as physical as, you know, Michigan um, and maybe even a little bit of the Wisconsin, you know. Um, but Michigan, like you said, I think they might be a team to, to watch out for and I think that they might end up knocking Oregon out of the next round. Safe prediction there, really, with how they're playing. So your biggest takeaways there, Rhett. Uh, and I'm going to get into these calls in case people aren't aware of, of what we're talking about with how bad this, this tournament has been officiated. I'm going to break down the five games that, I, that really stand out where the, the calls that were – uh, made or not made, literally costed these teams exactly. a game. And and it's a problem. But, Rhett, you agree? It's rough. really bad. So I, I've seen calls being waited until the ball goes in the basket. Um, and I've seen it actually even hit the floor. Like, the ball almost made it down to the other end of the court before the ref blew the whistle. Like, the one just thing plays I, like that. Mind-boggling. The one thing I will say about the refing, I, I agree uh, but just following the SEC all year, I mean, there was games that, that I'd text you uh, at work, Kyle, and be like, they had 50 fouls, 60 fouls in a game. Now they've taken it to the other extreme of, you're right, they're not calling hardly uh, anything, Which, but in my opinion, I would rather it kind of be the way it is. I'm not really so much talking, I guess, about the bad, obvious calls. I'm more talking about fouls, so I'd rather let them get in there and beat and bang and, and – uh, let them play as opposed to watching somebody shoot 40 free throws. Exactly. Uh, you know, oh, no one doubt. We want is consistency. And I think that we've not seen too much consistency throughout the play or throughout the tournament um, for officiating. 
Yeah, no, no doubt about that. Well, let me go back to to my breakdown of the takeaways here. I have some interesting interesting stats along with it. So with my first one about the, the upsets, you know, that were more prominent in the second round than the first round, two of the teams stood out to me, and that is who we've talked about, number seven seed Michigan and number seven seed South Carolina. Michigan is on a seven-game winning streak right now. They've won 12 out of their last 14 games. And what's amazing to me about their run is that this was a team that was an eight seed in the Big Ten tournament. They were toward the bottom half of, of the seeding in the Big Ten, and yet look what they've done. It's very impressive, and for me, who follows the Big Ten all year as an Iowa and Indiana fan, it's, you know, it, just like Shane, you with the SEC, people don't, people overlook it. They, they, they don't, you know, you assume because you don't have as many top 25 teams in there that you're not a top conference, and that's just not true. We saw teams at the very bottom of the Big Ten and SEC conferences upset. We see what they're doing here in the NCAA tournament. You know, Northwestern, had they not potentially been ripped off, we don't know how the outcome of that game would have turned out, but that would have been the fourth Big Ten team. Oh, they definitely the had the momentum 16. going into that. I mean, I truly believe that they they would have won that game. Yeah, yeah, and I do too. And so that's that's for me. Michigan's run right now is absolutely incredible, and they they're it just goes to show you what the conference schedule throughout the year does for these teams to prepare them. Uh, they definitely were underrated, and and for me all along, you know, I though I have a little Big Ten bias, yes, but. You know, I, I was able to look at the overall conferences objectively as well, and I didn't have the Big Ten as the top conference or the SEC. I did have them toward the bottom, but I also stood up for these teams in these conferences because they were playing good basketball, and now we see how good they really are. But South Carolina, seven seed. So they th- – this is the most – the, the biggest surprise to me right now in this tournament. This South Carolina team has won four out of their last six games, but they didn't come into the tourney hot. They were a four seed in the SEC tourney. They lost their first game to Alabama in the quarterfinals, and they really, really have taken a step back, you know, leading into the tournament with how they weren't playing so well, and they lost to a couple bad teams before the tournament. And it just goes to show you, you know, what the tournament does for teams. Teams, you know, teams get inspired. Hey, everything's on the line. Let's play like there's nothing to lose. And that's what they are doing right now. I don't think anybody saw that upset coming against Duke, but they're a physical team. They're playing hot right now. They're playing like the South Carolina team earlier in the year in the SEC. And, yeah, you know, it's it's a big surprise to me. So that that was my first – take away uh, with the upsets in the first and second round and the teams that I think are really shocking me. Now, my second one goes along with what we were saying, the Big Ten SEC reputations, worst Power Five conferences, now looking like two of the best. So I have some records here from breaking down the five Power Five conferences in the NCAA tournament to this point. The Big Ten tournament records eight and four but have three teams in the Sweet 16. SEC tournament record is 7-2 with three teams in the the Sweet 16. The Big 12 tournament record is 8-3. Good, but they also have three teams in the Sweet 16, so the same as these other two. The Pac-12 tournament record is excellent. They're 8-1, three teams in the Sweet 16, though. Uh, The ACC tournament record, 7-8. They have one team in the Sweet 16. I just found that unbelievable, you know, because we had heard all year, oh, the ACC is, is the best conference in college basketball by a landslide, and, and it's proving to clearly not be true. Now, you know, they do, they did have the top of the conference was very good, yes, and a couple of them got upset, but the middle and bottom of that conference was no better than the SEC or the Big Ten, and I could make the argument that it was worse. And you mention all the time, Shane, that how well you guys played in the SEC Big 12 Challenge. Talking about the Big 12, a lot of people thought that was like the second best conference this year. So found that very interesting. And then with my third takeaway, so let's set up 
uh, for the listeners with this officiating, what we're talking about here. So the worst officiating I've ever seen in an NCAA tournament. There have been at least four blown calls, but I'm going with five, and I am going to break these down so people understand them. And and I got I'm I'm going to get this this information from Henry Bushnell on Yahoo.com. So the first one, let's talk about the Gonzaga Northwestern one. So this one is not debatable. This one I am still in awe about, and. What it was, was Northwestern was on a huge run. They were getting blown out in this game to Gonzaga, and they come str- they come storming back. They were down by 22. They cut it to five with five minutes to go. And Derek Pardon was a split second away from cutting the lead to three for Northwestern. However, Gonzaga freshman Zach Collins reached his hand up through the cylinder Uh and rejected the shot. Now, this would have cut it to three with five minutes left. Keep in mind, they had all of the momentum in this game, and that is a lot of time, and it's hard to stop momentum. In, in In the history of sports, if you... And I don't have a stat. I don't know if there is one out there. But I would I would venture more times than not that teams with momentum that have gone on big runs do not usually end up losing the game. I have no it doubt. is hard to stop a team with runs, right? Yeah. Yes. So that was the worst blown call I've ever seen. I mean, you could you could be in the upper through. level. What's that, right? His hand was fully through the inside of that run. It was yeah, insane. and it's a clear violation you cannot block you cannot not call a goal tang in that situation the rule is very obvious when a hand is put through the cylinder of a rim the net even went up. and yeah no exactly and i mean you could have seen that from the top balcony of that arena i mean that i it's to what's amazing to me about this is these refs are supposed to be the best in the business they're getting paid for that they are experienced and I just don't understand how some, something so obvious that you, all three of us could make, they get wrong. So uh, that was just mind-boggling to me. That was the first one. The second one, this was North Carolina and Arkansas game. There were a couple blown calls in this. But with under a minute to play in this game, Arkansas had the Tar Heels on the ropes. Okay, so Joel Berry for North Carolina had the ball with five seconds on the shot clock. He drove right, and then he he picked up his dribble after two bounces. And how many steps did he take? Oh, I mean, it, three, four, beyond, five? It was, like a, it was like a European league uh, four or five-step walk, yeah. Well, okay, so there was the first call they missed. But, af- but after they missed that one, how about the charge yeah. that was right after that travel? I mean, he, he bulldozed the guy, and not one whistle – Went off, and obviously, what in what ensued? Thank off the Barry shot. shot off the backboard was tipped in by Kennedy Meeks, and then they en- w- ended up going on to win. So they're clear example of another game decided by the refs. It's just unbelievable to me, and it, it, it's it's so frustrating. I couldn't imagine being a fan or a player or coach on of these teams. The third one, this was St. Mary's in Arizona. This was a very close game late. The Gales forward Jordan Hunter was called for a loose ball foul after a teammate's missed three. So when you look at it at first glance, Hunter didn't make contact with Arizona's Alonzo Trier. But a second look shows that the foul should have been on another Arizona's player, Laura Markinen, who made contact with Hunter from behind, and it was so obvious. That's why he flew out of bounds, you know. So they said that there there wasn't enough contact between Hunter and Tier to call a foul on the St. Mary's player in that situation. And what ended up happening, Arizona ended up prevailing. Unbelievable. The fourth one, Seton Hall's flagrant foul call. This was Seton Hall against Arkansas, first round, down by one with the shot clock turned off. Desi Rodriguez shoved an Arkansas player to put the Razorbacks on the line. The The problem was the referees went to monitor and deemed the push a flagrant one, which by the rule you could argue maybe it was correct. There was no play on the ball. However, this 
play if this play occurred, this is where a lot of people have a problem with it. If this play occurred with ten minutes left in the first half and is determined to be a, be a flagrant, there's no argument. But half the calls at the end of the games aren't plays on the balls, and flagrants rarely get called. So after the refs reviewed the play, they kept the fall, foul as a common foul, and you know a lot of people say refs are supposed to use common sense in these situations, and they didn't in this Seton Hall Arkansas game, and it ended up costing Seton Hall the game. My fifth and final one: the Oregon Rhode Island second Tribute round game. Again. So with 138 remaining in the second round matchup. Rhode Island and Oregon were tied at 72. So these Rams, big underdogs, again, all the momentum. They had the ball. E.C. Matthews drove from the left wing where Dylan Brooks was waiting. Matthews elevated, but he didn't go straight into Brooks. He slid toward the baseline, but made contact with Brooks because Brooks slid underneath him. Brooks leaned in with his right shoulder, hit Matthews' right hip, and fell to the floor. The refs whistled Matthews for the offensive foul. Are you kidding me? So, you know, these block charge decisions are extremely difficult to make in real time, yes. But this one was, was obviously wrong, and it cost the Rams the game. So then what happened two possessions later, Tyler Dorsey won the game for Oregon with that three-pointer. So, so many questionable calls, guys, and I wanted to give the listeners a background of what we were talking about if they hadn't seen these games. But it's unacceptable to me, so now I want your guys' input, you know, what are your thoughts on on these blown calls here? You know, I think the the most the one that stood out to me the most was the Gonzaga game. You know, sticking your hand through the rim. It's I don't understand how that was missed. Um, it's just mind boggling that the player could stick his hand through the rim and take the net up with him, and, and just fully up at the top. I don't understand it. Uh, no call, but you know that's the one that stood out to me the most, Shane. That's- yeah, I seen the coach for uh, Providence on CBS talking about that call, and he basically said they would have had to escort him out of the building. Yeah, I mean, because <laughs> you know the coach caught a the the coach for Northwestern caught a little bit of grief, you know, for getting the the technical foul. But here's what I don't understand: they review the the which was a missed call, just like you said, the uh, foul from Seton Hall, in Arkansas. But this play that we're talking about is not reviewable so it's like if you're going to use the moniker then then use it for plays that need to be used or otherwise don't use the monitor and go back the way it was i don't understand how you cannot use the monitor for something like that what was there i know there wasn't what two three minutes left four minutes it was under five i yeah. believe when it happened but you can't go to the monitor over that one but you can when obviously you know they called that flagrant and and it just doesn't doesn't make any sense to me. It's it's just these are supposed to be the best officials from the different conferences, and they are the most experienced. I don't understand how you can miss calls like these. And listen, I'm not usually a guy to complain about refereeing and the calls, the officiating. I, I'm not. I don't, you know, even when my teams lose, you know, it's the easy excuse to go to. Um, but it – unless it is obvious like these, I'll generally not blame it on the refs. But you can't not blame this on the refs, you know. And obviously different things could have happened throughout the games. You know, Northwestern could have not got down by 22. You know, it's it's understood. But the bottom line is at the end of these games, when the calls matter the most, they're getting them wrong. And it's costing these teams the games that they work all season for. Some of these kids never going to play another college basketball game. It's just – it, it, it's unacceptable to me. I don't think these refs that have made these calls should be allowed to officiate certainly another NCAA tournament game, but maybe they need to go uh, revisit their their refereeing school classes because this is uh, it's unbelievable to me. But nonetheless, the Sweet 16 is set, so we'll move on from the refs, men, and we will go preview the Sweet 16 now. So we already talked about the games. we got Wisconsin, Florida. Baylor, South Carolina, Gonzaga, West Virginia, Xavier, Arizona, Kentucky, UCLA, North Carolina, Butler, and Oregon, Michigan, finally Kansas, Purdue. So I want to know your guys' matchups that you are looking forward to the most. 
No, I'm think actually looking forward to the Kansas and Purdue game. Um, I think that one's going to be an interesting one, and hopefully, hopefully Purdue can knock out the the big birds. Um, I think they can, <laughs> but Shane, uh, I'm going to try and be objectively speaking, but I would <laughs> think most people, uh, at least the most entertaining game should be the Kentucky UCLA game. But just sitting here looking at them, I'm actually excited that I'm off for Thursday because those four games Thursday are unbelievable with Michigan, Oregon starting it off, West Virginia, Gonzaga. And I believe the Mountaineers can uh, can beat the Zags. And then Purdue, Kansas, you're right. I watched the uh, Purdue game, uh, the last game they played, and Swanigan can get a little bit of help. Uh, and yeah. and yeah. Kansas is a, is a little off. They they can pull the upset. And then you got Xavier, Arizona, and uh, – you know, Xavier lost – they're kind of like South Carolina. They started – you know, lost towards the end. But, I mean, they're red – they're red hot. So, they're going to give Arizona all they want. I, I was looking at the spreads, and the largest spread seven and a half, and that's the Xavier-Arizona. The other one's – Kansas game is a five. The West Virginia-Gonzaga is three and a half. And then the Michigan-Oregon right now is a one for Michigan. So, I think Thursday's loaded. And uh, – yeah. but, of course, uh, uh, the Kentucky-UCLA game, so – Two uh two of the most winningest programs as far as uh championships go uh, all time and uh, maybe wins too but the the matchups for me guys really all of them I honestly I I'm very intrigued on I've I love the tournament it's been a great tournament this year I am upset and jealous Shane that you get to be off Thursday and I have to work. Um, you get to and I also have to work. Game. Yeah, and I also, and then I have to work overtime Friday, <laughs> so I get to miss yep. all of the Sweet 16 games, which is just phenomenal, right? No, uh, I will get to see the Elite Eight, which is good. I will follow the games at work, um, but you know, I'd like to see the Big Ten continue to do well. There's a little Big Ten bias there. Yes, I'd like to see Wisconsin continue their run. I would like to see Michigan continue their run. Um, and, you know, I, I really I really would love to see Purdue win as much as that hurts to say. Being an Indiana fan, they are representing for the state very well. I love the teams representing, representing for the state. Butler, once again, I will be cheering for them. So there's teams I'm cheering for here. I'm curious to see if South Carolina can continue their run and upset Baylor. I want to see it happen. I know a couple people I work with and management-wise on my shift are big South Carolina fans, so they're hoping so as well. But um, I really – honestly, I, I don't know if there's going to be a blowout in this Sweet 16, uh, and, and including then when the Elite Eight happens Saturday and Sunday. These games are so – seem to be so evenly matched. I will say, if there were to be a blowout, in my mind, Xavier's playing good basketball right now, but I would say that would be the one game, Xavier-Arizona, that if Arizona plays better than they did last game, like they've played the second half of the year, I think Arizona could run away with it a bit, but I still don't see more than maybe a 10-11 point game. I I think they're going to be, all of them, good games. So, Let's go down the line and just make our picks here, all right? Wisconsin, Florida, who do you have, Rhett? Uh, I'm taking Wisconsin. All right, Shane? I'm going to be a homer and go for the SEC, but Florida's hot. So <laughs> Florida's playing really good. I, I think they got a chance to uh, go to the Final Four, believe it or not. Yeah, uh, they are a hot team. They're a surprise to me. They are without their big man. I think that will hurt Florida, but uh, I'm taking Wisconsin. Uh, I'm taking the Big Ten here. I think Wisconsin's on a roll. They've been, they their experience, been to the Final Four, this group together. So uh, I, I I like Wisconsin in that matchup. Baylor, South Carolina. I'm going as much as I'd love to go with South Carolina. I think they keep it close. I I think the magic ends here. I think Baylor wins this game. Just too much size down low with Motley. Um, I'm I'm taking Baylor. How about you guys? I'm taking Baylor also. Well, I'm not right gonna. Now. Yeah, I'm not gonna be a homer because I've watched South Carolina all year, and you you hit the nail on the head the way they played at the end of the year. And just briefly on the the Duke game, the first half South Carolina missed 21 out of 27 shots, but then in the second half they turned around and shot 70. percent So I, I see the run ending, and I'm gonna go with Baylor. 
All right. Next, we have Gonzaga, West Virginia. I am going to – this was this was a tough pick for me, but I do – I do believe in the Zags this year more than any of their other teams. I think they get to the Elite Eight. I think it's going to come down to maybe a last-second shot, but I think Gonzaga will play better than they did in the last game against Northwestern. I think, they, I think they're tired of hearing about everybody overlooking them and thinking they're overrated. Uh, I think Gonzaga wins this one. Oh, what about you guys? I like you, Kyle. But taking West Virginia on this one, West Virginia has looked hot. Um, I've liked it. Gonzaga. Press Virginia. Press Virginia. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was fixing to say. I'm going with <laughs> – go ahead, Rhett. It's pretty deadly with that press, and I love it. And I think that they will – they're going to expose Gonzaga a little bit, and, you know, I'm picking West Virginia. I am. Good deal. I'm going with Press Virginia and Huggy Bear and his elastic khaki pants. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Uh, all right. They, I mean, Gonzaga's, what, 19 years and hadn't made it to the Final Four, so I, I think it'll be 20. <laughs> all right, so he's – you guys are against me. That's all right. All right, and uh, the last team out of the West region here, last matchup, Xavier taking on Arizona. I think I already gave you guys my pick. I think Arizona wins by about 10 or so. I think Xavier's run ends here. Uh, I think losing one of their best players will catch up to them in this game. Um, I, I take Arizona in this you know, one. I'm taking Arizona too. I'm going to go ahead and give a shout out to TJ Newman out in Arizona, but brother, I am definitely taking Arizona on this one and potentially riding them all the way. Whoa. Wow. Prediction time. Okay. How about that? Right. Good deal. All right. And Shane, my heart says Xavier, just because the point guard, um, uh, was top finalist for Mr. Basketball in Kentucky last year from Campbellsville University, Quentin Goodwin. But yeah, good for him. Yeah, my head says uh, Arizona. All right, Arizona. All right, now to the South region. What you really want to talk about here, Shane? Your Kentucky Wildcats taking on UCLA. Oh boy, I I uh, <laughs> I really wish that I could watch this game. I'm going to do everything I can to oh, certainly follow it. the game. We're going to watch it Tuesday <laughs> night. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Oh yeah, you're gonna we, yeah. we're gonna work together. Yeah, so gonna you're gonna come together. in. You're not yep. you're not calling in. It, so this is yeah, it didn't work out last time. So I'm not calling in <laughs> unless they make it to the final game. <laughs> uh, I understand. Well, okay. So my prediction, you're not gonna like it, Shane. I think your Wildcats run ends here. I think it is a great game with these two historical programs going at it. But in the end, I just think that UCLA is a better defensive team. I think that they are going to be able to expose your cats by maybe playing a 2-3 zone. And if you you guys aren't shooting well, not making your threes, you know, if you know Fox needs to make a couple or whatever, then I really do think, and that's what I think is going to happen, I really do think UCLA wins in a shootout. Um, but I'm taking the Bruins to move like on to the Elite Eight. I like it. Rhett? Um, you know, UK and UCLA, it's going to be a tough one. Um, UCLA, I'm not looking forward to them winning. Um, I am. That's my prediction. I am taking UCLA. But, you know, I do hate LeVar Ball and um, – I'm kind of out of spite. You're not the only one. one. <laughs> <laughs> the balls, you know, yes. Um, UK, I mean, they've been playing pretty strong. Malik Monk, you know, he struggled uh, shooting-wise, but he played some heck of defense last game. Um, and Yeah, a couple, couple uh, big blocks down the end there from know, Kentucky. It's which... not, you know, if you're having a, a bad night on the offensive end, you know, some people don't get it. They just keep chucking them up, and, you know, it's – it's a good thing to find it in other areas if you are struggling. And I think that's what that kid did. And, you know, I think that you know, it's going to be a tough game, but I'm taking UCLA. Well, okay. Uh, and I'm, Shane? I'm, yeah, I'm not saying it just to be a homer, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm yeah, picking, you are. No, I'm not. I'm picking Kentucky because just like my theory, it's hard to beat a team twice. Twice. And uh, just Ooh. for me, a couple key must that Kentucky TJ Leaf destroyed us that game and Rupp and it wasn't so much ball the rest of them so we must contain Leaf and I think objectively speaking our defense over the last 10 or 15 games is why we haven't lost we've tremendously improved our defense 
And uh, uh, the second thing, and to me, the key stat is if Monk scores 20 points or more, I'm not saying he has to have a 47 point game like he does. If he just gets to his average of 21, 20 in that range, uh, I, I think we will. Uh, uh, I think we'll pull it out. I I I can respect you sticking with your squad and and it would not surprise me if Kentucky wins. That's the thing. I I mean it's it's two great teams going at it. Um, I I just yeah Kentucky they're going to have to shoot the ball well and play good defense. It's what it's going to come down to. I'll tell you you know and if UCLA doesn't play good defense, if they can't stop Monk and Fox in the transition, then they're going to lose to Kentucky because that's what Kentucky did well in the first matchup against UCLA earlier. The Bruins had no answer. Monk was down the floor in three seconds putting the ball in the hoop. Yep. So, you know, if Kentucky is able to play that way and execute and Coach Cal can figure out how to outsmart Coach Alford, then uh, then it would not surprise me if Kentucky won. But I'm just going with the Bruins, and I just can't pick the Wildcats <laughs> as a Hoosier. I can't. I can't do it. So, yeah, uh, UCLA for me, UCLA for for you, Rhett. Yep. And and Kentucky for Shane. All right. And now the uh, the the next matchup in the South, North Carolina Butler. I tell you what, I hope Butler wins so badly in this game, but I think it's a bad matchup for Butler. Uh, North Carolina is the team I picked to be the national champion, and I think I'm going to have to uh, stick with it. Even though my bracket's been busted, I, I have to stick with my champion that's still alive in it. North Carolina is going to win, but it's going to be a dogfight. Butler will keep it close, and uh, I think just in the end, too much size for North Carolina, and I don't think Joel Berry and some of their guards will struggle as much as they did against Arkansas. I think I heard that was the the worst shooting performance of North Carolina um, in the NCAA tournament ever, and maybe it was this season too. It was one or the other, but it was just not a good game for them. But I think they bounced back and beat Butler. You guys? Um, You know, I think that they had a pretty rough game last game, but also Butler's nothing to sneeze at. Um, I think Mm -mm. they're going to have a a tough match. And, you know, some people are even predicting – UNC to lose this game um but like like you did I picked them to be my national champions and I'm riding that all the way to the end so UNC and Shane as bad as I hate to say it I agree with you it's a kind of bad matchup for Butler and uh I still believe after the officiating this should be Arkansas versus Butler because they had all the (laughs) momentum but uh I'm gonna have to take North Carolina Understood, understood. All right, the last two Sweet 16 matchups in the Midwest, Oregon and Michigan tomorrow night. Oh, man, am I, am I looking forward to this game and unfortunately happen to follow it. Um, I am going with the hot team right now, the team that seems to be the team of destiny. I'm taking the Wolverines out of the Big Ten. It's going to be a great game. Uh, but I think that Michigan, they are showing just how underrated they were all year long. This team's physical down low. They, these, their guards can really step out and shoot. Wagner for, for Michigan is going to be a tough handle for Oregon. Uh, he can step out and shoot the three as well as anybody on the Michigan team. Uh, I really, really like the, the Michigan Wolverines to move on to the Elite Eight. How about you guys? You know, it, my, my heart says Oregon, but my head says Michigan. And, you know, I have Oregon moving on in my bracket, but I think, you know, you have to go with the hot team right now, and that's Michigan. So I'm taking Michigan. Considering I've watched Oregon play in the Pac-12 about as much as I have Kentucky, um, I would like to see Michigan. It's a great story, but I think it ends, and I think Oregon uh, uh, squeaks it out. But it is a game I'm looking forward to. It wouldn't surprise me, to be honest. That's why it's a pick em game and right now in Vegas. That, uh, uh, But I do think Oregon's going to squeak it out. And finally, a matchup again, one of my favorite matchups in the Sweet 16, Kansas taking on Purdue tomorrow night. Oh, boy, will this be a good game. I'll tell you, I am so tempted to pick Purdue in this game uh, with the Big Ten. I watched them a lot this year. They are a tough team to handle. They have 
two of the best big men in the country in Swanigan and Haas. They also who ha- Swanigan can step out and shoot the three, which we saw there in the second round against Iowa State, which helped them hang on. But also their guard play is phenomenal. Uh, their forwards, I mean, they can all play the guard position. I mean, uh, but uh, in the end, I think that Rex's Jonathan Webb Rex's Kansas Jayhawks move on to the Elite Eight. Give a little shout out to my buddy Rex. I'm taking the Jayhawks. This team is for real this year. Uh, unlike past Bill Self's teams, where it seems like Gonzaga, they don't get it done. This is a different Kansas team with experience. Josh Jackson is too much to handle for Purdue in this game. It comes down to the wire. In the end, Kansas rock chalk moves oh, on. This is going to be a great matchup. Um, I, I took Purdue. I took Purdue. Um, Kansas, they've been playing hot. And tell you what, I did not expect them to be playing that good. And honestly, I don't think a lot of people did. Uh, I'm still going to ride Purdue on this one. Um, what can I say? Got to sticking with it. Sticking with the Indiana school. And I'm shame. going with Rhett just because I hate Kansas that much. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding. I tell you what, I, and I followed Iowa State all year long just because the coach was a ex Murray State coach, and Iowa State had all the momentum. They'd come back, and I thought they was going to win that game, and and Purdue impressed me at the end. I mean, they they uh, toughed it out and uh, had every chance to lose that game, and they won. If they can get a little bit of outside shooting to where they don't have to rely on Swanigan getting 25, 30 points. And if he can just get his norm, I, I truly believe because Kansas is like Gonzaga. You know, they're due for a bad game, and, and they get cold from outside. I can see Purdue pulling this game out. It's just like the Can- Kentucky-UCLA game. I just have to go with the pick, and if I had money on it, then I would go with Kansas, and that's who I'm picking. But uh, I'd like to see Purdue win. I'd like to see the Big Ten and the, the team representing the state. I told Rex that he does not want this matchup, and he said that he did. Well, guess what? He gets it. So we'll see what happens. I mean, who are they going to – they don't have an answer for Swanigan. I mean, which they're not the only team in the country who doesn't have an answer for Swanigan, but he's, he's a beast. He is, and he has to play he's consistently because he, he has right? had a couple games where he's played inconsistent, and if he does that, then that's that's – where I think Kansas will get the edge. Uh, but, yeah, you're right. He has just been dominant all year long. Rhett, what were you I saying? I said that dude is NBA ready. He is a big dude, and he is – tell you what, I would not want to be guarding him down low. <laughs> no. No, uh-uh. I I certainly wouldn't. Uh, that would be a tough matchup. But, anyways, that is our Sweet 16 p- predictions. We'll set up the Elite Eight for this weekend and on uh, – and then on next week's show, Rhett, we'll, we'll recap the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, and we'll preview the Final Four. Um, but before we end this show, because there was breaking news a few days ago, and I'm a Hoosier, and Rhett, whether you admit it or not, you're a Hoosier living there in Bloomington, uh, we've got some big news out of, out of B-Town here, and we're going to talk about it. So Tom Crean is out as the head coach at Indiana University after nine years, has been fired. He finished with a 166 and 135 record for the Hoosiers, and now the question is, who is next? So before I get your guys' reactions, let me give you a little bit of statistics here on Crean and then who I think. I'll I'll mention the coaches that were uh, that are on the radar for the job, and I'll tell you who I think is the best fit, and then you guys will go at it. Um, so Tom Crean, the 50-year-old, just didn't get it done in Indiana. So my first take on this is it was time. Uh, I, I think Tom Crean's a great man, but when you're at a historical program like Indiana and you only make three Sweet 16s in nine years and you only qualify for four NCAA tournaments in the past six years, it's time to go not to mention only two regular season Big Ten championships during his time in Bloomington. So, uh, you know, he was our longest tenured coach in Indiana since Bob Knight got fired in 2000. Um, You know, he took over a program that was abysmal at the time. Uh, it It was not good. You know, he takes over just a few years after Indiana 
went to the championship game against Maryland. You know, he takes over a few, just a few years after that. The Crean, you know, the the era, uh, it, it was it was rough. You know, scholarships are down. This the Hoosiers program. You know, you couldn't you couldn't even sell out Assembly Hall, which was unheard of. But you know, his his legacy is going to likely center on his first three years at Indiana. That's when he rebuilt um, the team after leaving Marquette. Um, but the three years that he took over as coach, uh, they were the worst three-year stretch in Indiana basketball history. That's what he was left to deal with. The Hoosiers won just 28 games in three years. They finished last in the conference twice, and they had to endure uh, an almost bottom-up roster to rebuild uh, because, you know, people that might not have remembered, Tom Crean brought the program when he was hired out from the NCAA sanctions situation from former coach Kelvin Sampson. It was just a mess. Um, And so I appreciate what he did there with that. He signed two NBA prospects, uh, Cody Zeller and Victor Oladipo, who are doing well in the NBA right now. You know, there's there's been a great list of other players that came out of the program during his time. But um, the bottom the bottom line is he just didn't get it done. And I, I have to, I have to give this stat. In his last six years, he his teams finished fifth, first, ninth, seventh, first, and tenth in the Big Ten. Uh, the Hoosiers' best was very good, uh, one of the best offenses in the country. Injuries did the team in this year. Ultimately, uh, they did have one of the best home records against ranked opponents in the country in recent years. Uh, but you know, the, the worst was definitely the worst with him. Uh, he, this, this year or in his tenure, he was only five and 10 against in-state rival Purdue. He won just five combined games against Wisconsin and Michigan state. And he never won in Madison. He does leave with a winning record. It's, it's not, it's not fancy, you know, it's not good enough. 55% winning percentage is just not very good. So with that being said, and he's gone, now it's looking to the future. And what does it hold for IU basketball? Well, it holds a lot of good. And here are some of the names that are being thrown out there for uh, the Indiana head coaching position. I'm hearing Brad Stevens from the NBA and the Celtics, which is more than likely not going to happen. He's, he's even said that he enjoys coaching in the NBA. So we can move right on past that, though I would love that hire with what he did in the state with Butler. Um, another one I'm hearing, Billy, Billy Donovan with Oklahoma City. I don't I see that happening either, uh, and, I, and I wouldn't like that hire, so I'm glad that that's kind of being shot down. Uh, then there's Sean Miller with Arizona. Um, that's, there's, there's quite a bit of people that feel that could happen. Uh, again, don't want to see that happen, really. Uh, uh, Sean Miller's never been to the Final Four, um, so I, I, don't, I don't see that happening. Don't want it. Tony Bennett from Virginia, another one like Miller. He's never been to the Final Four, um, and we've seen these last couple of years what's happened with them being coming in as one of the top teams in the ACC and then – uh, when it comes to the tournament time, they get upset. So none of them. So here's the the core group of coaches that a lot of people think it's going to almost for certain be one of them. UCLA, Steve Alford, Baylor's Scott Drew, Butler's Chris Holtman, Xavier's Chris Mack, Wichita State's Greg Marshall, and Dayton's Archie Miller. Okay, so now my prediction and what I think it needs to be. Steve Alford, former Mr. Basketball in Indiana, Hall of Famer. It's his home state. He has all of his roots in Indiana. He was uh, he was he is the second all-time leading scorer in Indiana history. He has the most three-pointers in NBA, in, in Indiana history. Uh, he is Indiana basketball, and what Steve Alford would do leaving UCLA to come to Indiana is he, I think he would bring 
that recruiting edge back to Indiana. I think he would keep players in state. I think people would respect him. And, you know, oddly enough, uh, Bob Knight, the only, the, only, uh, the only person that Bob Knight did not hate was Steve Alford. And he basically uh, hated everybody else at Indiana in management, but not Steve Alford. He's specially special to the state of Indiana. His alma mater, it needs to be Steve Alford. And I think that if it is Steve Alford, Indiana basketball uh, is set for years to come. There's my take. Now, gentlemen, out of those coaches I mentioned that a lot of people think it will certainly be, who do you think it is? will and should be well to be honest i feel like it's not going to be steve alfred steve alfred or uh billy donovan uh those are the two that i wouldn't mind seeing but i I do not see that end up happening um ucla i feel like he's got it good at ucla i feel like he's going to stay and then billy donovan you know i think that he's going to stay with the thunder so you know i i definitely think it's going to be somebody else i don't think it's going to be either two of those and those would be the two that I would like to see. My question to you was, why would Steve Alford leave UCLA? While I agree with Rhett that, to me, the last few years, UCLA, just the last few years, has been equal, at least, if not a step above, Indiana. Before I got on, I looked up the coaches' salaries, and I think Tom Crean was making about $3 million, $2.9, somewhere in there, and Steve Alford was making two point seven. so there's not really a huge money difference going from UCLA to Indiana. He, he's out there chilling. He's got a recruiting machine going on. But I do hope it is Steve Alford. It would be very cool to see um, not so much a Bob Knight era again, but um, I enjoyed watching Indiana basketball as a kid when they were good. So uh, I think it will be Steve Alford. It's too much of a uh, kind of homecoming and uh, – I seen your boy Dan Doctage in an interview, and he was like, let's get somebody back from Indiana that cares about it, that was raised, that understands the culture in Indiana. So uh, I think it will be offered. I don't think you're getting the two guys from the NBA. You don't want Greg Marshall and his crazy wife. Um, I, I mean, Archie Miller, yeah, I, I, he's a younger coach. I would take him over Sean. Sean's not leaving Arizona. I mean, they're right below Kentucky, Kansas, Duke, and that tier. Um so I, I, I think it will be offered. Well, I can answer your question uh, of why I think he would, will be a good hire outside of what I said or, or why he would leave is, is your question because I explain why I think he would be the perfect hire. But uh, mainly because uh, up, till la- up until after the end of last season, they were everybody was ready to fire him at UCLA. Because he, though he has improved a lot this year with his recruiting, he hasn't done phenomenal at UCLA. And they, you know, he was on the hot seat last year with with his with the just the fan base and everybody pushing him out because you know UCLA basketball isn't where it should be. And so the fact that that they are. Now going to, like I said, his son's going to graduate. Ball, ball's going to go to the NBA. Probably another one of their players or two is going to leave this team and go to the NBA. It's like, what, well, what else does he really have? You know, he it, going back to Indiana, it's it, he'll get to start over and he'll get to be right back at home. And so I, I think it is the perfect situation for her to him to leave. Especially, let's say they lose to you guys, to Kentucky in the Sweet 16. There's another Sweet 16 exit for him because he, uh, just a couple of years ago, he did make the f- Sweet 16, That was and that was their first Sweet 16 appearance since 2008, but uh, they did lose to Florida that year. So haven't been past the Sweet 16 there, and so I just, I see it as uh, a situation where just the pressure to come to Indiana. I think the team that's going to leave him at UCLA, and then if they don't get it done this year, there's going to be more calling. Yeah, go ahead and go to Indiana. You know, you didn't you didn't get it done for us again, and we know you really want to. So just go ahead and go because again, you know, they were quick to write him off after last year. So, anyways, that Shane is why hey, I no, think one he's. Thing. Why would you want to come to Indiana? 
when you know like like the athletic director said um they want to win and they want to win now you know if you're coming from ucla and you have a let's say they lose tomorrow um actually was it friday friday um and they have a six sweet 16 exit you know why would you want to come to indiana when they've already set that that bar really high wanting to make it to a championship right away um you know i I feel like you'd be coming into like a bad situation with a lot of pressure well it's not like that pressure isn't there already at ucla again that's why they were ready to push him out of the door last year i mean i can tell you right now tom cream's been wanted to they've wanted to push him out the door for at least two to three years now and people are just flip-flopping back and forth and I, i you know i I could see Steve Alford coming, and I think it'd be pretty awesome, actually. But I just, you know, first of all, why would you want to leave? Why would you want to move to Indiana, first of all? Leave, I feel like that. Leave, leave beautiful women and beaches. <laughs> That's kind of what I'm thinking of. You know, also with the home <laughs> type of thing. But, you know. That's exactly why, because it's the hometown. The home, You know the saying. Home is where the heart is, and that's the truth. And I think and if Steve we'll Alford, if, if he could come to Indiana and turn that program around and make it Indiana like it was, I mean, he could be the governor of Indiana. So I, I, to me, I think it's one of the hero or zeros. And, but then it's like, what happens if it goes south and he gets fired in a couple of years? Will that tarnish the beloved son that won the championship? You know, it, that, that's a, he's right. Red is with a lot of pressure, but. I especially think if if UCLA does lose to Kentucky Friday, I wouldn't be shocked by Monday. It was already announced. Now, I got UCLA in the two of the three or one of the two brackets that I did actually winning it. So if they win the national title, you know, you're going to walk away from a school you just won the national title to which it would be justified if he went back home. But I, th- I think that's going to be a lot tougher decision. But all the other coaches out there, other than the two pros, haven't went to the Final Four. I mean, Greg Marshall's, you know, he what is – I mean, I realize it's Wichita State, but, I mean, they have been the Final Four. Yeah, they did go to the Final Four. So, I mean, he's making $3 million, which is what they paid Crean, so I can't see – I can't see him leaving. But I do, from a personal standpoint, I'm not an IU fan at all, but I enjoyed when Kentucky played Indiana, when Louisville plays Indiana. So I think it'd be a neat story to get offered. Well, it sounds like we're pretty much on the same page with that, although Rhett doesn't think he will be hired and and leave UCLA. I, of course, do. Shane, you think he you really do think he will it sounds like and maybe unless he wins the title you think is what would keep that's him there that's what i think I, I truly uh, uh i truly think but you're i mean you it, it, home is home and uh, regardless of everything else that, that that has a lot of meaning and weight and uh, uh gee, unless they win the title i think it's a done deal and all for their all right fair enough i can certainly only hope so but we will see But that does it for today's podcast. Shane, thank you so much for joining us today. We had a a great time talking college hoops with you and and my Hoosiers with the head coach situation. Enjoy the Sweet 16, and I'll see you sometime soon at work. Awesome. Appreciate it. And uh, like I said, you guys, if uh, uh, Kentucky makes it to the final game, uh, I'm at least going to have like a guest call in or or get a couple minutes. with you guys but it has been a blast I, I enjoyed it and i appreciate you guys inviting me on no problem have a great one that does it for today's show thanks for tuning in everybody don't forget you can now subscribe to our podcast on itunes and have every episode available to you right on your smartphone or tablet you can also catch all of our podcasts on our website disputesports.com Follow us on Twitter at DisputeSports1, at Kyle M. Newman, and at Rhett Hensley. Until next week, remember, Dispute Sports. Anything sports, anytime, anywhere. Have a great day. See you.